Hello everyone and welcome back to History Indoors. We're we're back from our summer holidays. We're we're back and refreshed, ready to give plenty of fascinating history talks. We're so glad to have so many of you with us this this fine Tuesday uh, evening in September. Those who are regulars may know that we've host, host a talk on a Tuesday, not a Wednesday. That is because we have moved our days to Tuesdays. So make a note of that, that our days of talks are now Tuesdays rather than Wednesdays. And that's rather a selfish reason is because it's a day that I can do best to host a talk. So that's the main reason. Um, so do keep an eye out for Tuesdays as we aim to host a variety of, of talks um, coming up. And we've got a great schedule coming back up. So let me just say, say welcome back to History Indoors. We hope that you will enjoy these series of, of of talks coming up. If you are new, do subscribe to the YouTube channel. We'd love to have you part of the History Indoors community. We're over, we're nearly on 1,500 subscribers nearly, so please do subscribe. We'd love to get to that number soon, um, the more the merrier, and we'd love to have you along. If you don't know what we do, we, we, we host talks like this every, every fortnight, but also we have content on a variety of different things, like <laughs> film reviews and uh, this week in history is a lot of different old content that you can watch there's hundreds of videos so you'll never be bored i can tell you i can tell you that so do subscribe and do um do follow us on our journey um if you want history talks like this or history talks ranging from the roman period all the way through to the contemporary period so there's a lot of all kinds of people um so yeah do 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 stay tuned for more information on further talks coming up that's enough about history indoors i, I don't want to I bore you all about that you can follow us on twitter and facebook of course and instagram so if you haven't done that please do so um well you guys aren't here for me that's that's obvious you're here we're here for, for josh now josh has been part of history indoors i think really since it, its beginning um and you've done a lot of talks for us now josh you, it, it, must, it must be your i don't know how many talks you've given now but it must be a good number now um and Josh is, is, is a PhD student at the University of, of Essex, um, where he where he's researched Eurasians in in, in Singapore, um, and I believe he's now in his kind of completion near his PhD. And, and I hope it doesn't mind me saying that. So he is he is getting to the uh, end stages of his PhD, which you know I can't wait to read. I can't wait for him to finish it unless I can read it and and we can delve his brain more for for what he's been researching and writing about. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, but well, I, I will disappear in a second. I will just say uh, very briefly that do stay around after George is finished because there'll be a time for a Q&A as well. So time for you to ask questions and for Josh to respond to them as well. And I'll be around so I can also add my two two pence for a thought as well as they say. But that being said, Josh, I will, I will disappear because, again, enough of me. I'll let you take it away. I'm looking forward to hearing what you, what you have to say. So bye for me for now, and I'll appear at the end. Okay. Hello, everybody, and um, thank you to Michael, to History Indoors, for the opportunity to share my work tonight. With this, my second talk about sport and the Eurasians of pre-war Singapore. I'm very excited that my words this evening will be illustrated by some incredible unseen photographs of colonial Singapore. These are from scrapbooks compiled at the time by Conrad Hercules Clark, the most significant individual in the story of Eurasian sport before the Second World War. And we'll hear more of him later. And these scrapbooks have been lovingly preserved by Conrad's granddaughter, Louise Clark, and without Louise's kindness in sharing her family collection, my talk would not be so lavishly illustrated. And I'm incredibly grateful for her generosity and her support. My first talk about sport in colonial Singapore went out a few months ago and can still be found on YouTube and through the History Indoors website. And it looked at how playing sport, the games the British brought with them as their empire expanded, cricket, football, rugby, 
how they promoted imperial values. And as well as creating men fit to rule and run that empire, they were part of the ideological baggage that propped up the British Empire. Sporting prowess, learning to win and to lose like an English gentleman was a prized marker for entry into that exclusive club. The photograph we're looking at now has um, an aspirant bunch of sporting gentlemen, if ever I've seen one. And it's a picture of the Singapore football team in 1899. Or at least it's a picture of the team chosen to represent Singapore for a match against a team made of Malays from the state of Johor, playing for a trophy. You can see the cup in the centre of the picture, which was presented by the Sultan of Johor. And um, standing forth from the left is the young Conrad Hercules Clark. This Singapore team, dressed like typical public schoolboys of the time, children of the upper and middle class, arms folded, they look confidently into the camera, as determined and assured as the borders of the many minor and major privately funded private schools located across the empire, from Alberta to Adelaide, Cairo to Calcutta. These ones are past and present pupils of Raffles Institution, the top school in Singapore, where sons of Singapore's domiciled communities were educated to be upstanding and loyal subjects of the English king. It is a mixed team of Eurasians and Paranakan Chinese, of Chinese families established and living in Singapore. But what is not found in this most English of settings and most English of poses is an Englishman, a white man, a European, British elite sent their children home to be educated, to maintain a distance from the natives and to prevent their children getting the Chi Chi accent that immediately identified one as a local. These young men, in spite of the confidence and authenticity of their gaze, were subjects in an empire with a strict and strictly enforced racial hierarchy. And here we are in 1925, 26 years and one world war later, the Raffle Institution's winning hockey team, a mixed team of race of mixed races, but again, no Europeans in sight, apart from the English masters. By the 1920s, still subject to the color bar that kept them out of the prestigious white only establishments, the different races, Asian boys now educated to English gentlemanhood would coalesce around their own clubs with their own rules of exclusivity, learnt from the imperial playbook. And there were clubs for Malays, Indians, Chinese and Eurasian men to exercise and to socialise in the company of their peers in similar ways to their European masters. The Eurasian male shared the love of sport, accepted its rules-based nature and understood it as meaning the best man could win. And if the best man happened to be Eurasian, then why not? Playing within the rules of the game in fair and open competition was used as proof of the superiority of an imperial value system, which at its best was colorblind. Now, it may not have been their everyday truth, but in the club and on the sporting field, a different reality could prevail. Whiskey was drunk, cards were played, women were excluded. Although the Singapore Recreation Club was founded by Eurasians in the 19th century in response to the colour bar, in the 1920s, Eurasian women were still not even allowed on the club's premises, just like its white counterparts. 
the Singapore Cricket Club, for example. Mothers, wives, daughters were having to wait outside at their menfolk's pleasure. Now, this might create an impression of Eurasian women as shy and subservient, but I believe this photograph is a corrective for that. Here we have Eurasian women spending a day at the races in Singapore in 1923. They are wearing and looking their best, modern, fashionable and confident in what reflecting back now looks to us as classic 20s styles. A cosmopolitan style influenced by the all pervasive Hollywood movies and a growing international media which reported and reflected changing fashions, which favoured freedom from the confines of the corset. Newspapers and magazines have begun to speak of a new, youthful, modern girl ushering in an era of female emancipation. In colonial Singapore, part of an empire where women were still habitually kept in seclusion, uneducated and exploited, these Eurasian women embodying the modern girl were proof of a better and a possible future for women of all races. The rest of this talk is dedicated to a particular version of this new modern woman, what the press of Singapore called the sports girl and the pioneering role of Eurasian women in the emergence, in the emergence of this phenomenon. This is an early action shot of members of the Goldburn Sports Club playing netball, probably in 1929. The Goldburn Sports Club, named after its location, was the first name used by the Girls Sports Club, the first female sporting institution of Singapore. The Girls Sports Club was formed for Eurasian girls frustrated by the lack of facilities available to them. The gates of all clubs, including the Eurasian Singapore Recreation Clubs, were closed to them as members. And in response from the very beginning, the Girl Sports Club would be a club run by and for its Eurasian women members. Starting off with only 12 girls and no grounds or facilities of their own, the Girl Sports Club were a catalyst in the rapid growth of women's sports in 1930s Singapore. Members were schoolgirls, typists, telephone operators, stenographers and sales assistants. Although they would say all they wanted was somewhere to play, the Girl Sports Club soon became the example for others to follow. An embodiment of the modern girl of the movies and the magazines and the exploits of the sports girls would be topics for the local press. In practical terms, and apart from watching their brothers and fathers in action, girls in Singapore were introduced to sport at school. Although educational opportunities were limited for girls in Singapore, if you were fortunate, fortunate enough to go to school, games were now finally part of the school curriculum. Although there was a cadre of local teachers, Malays, Indians, Eurasians and Chinese, senior masters and mistresses were all British and brought netball and hockey with them. Word of the girls sports club reached an English teacher, Miss Griffith Jones, who challenged the girls to a hockey match. You can see her team here. It was these resourceful, educated women who taught the girls of Singapore, who had lived through the Great War, who were sisters and daughters of the suffragettes, all seismic changes ushering in a new world. The game was a charity fundraiser in aid of the Poppy Fund for veterans of the First World War. Here we have the first competitive match in Singapore between white European women against a non-white team, the Eurasian Girls Sports Club. A remarkable moment. And before, these Eurasian and British women would have met in the unequal relationship of teacher and pupil. 
maybe customer and sales assistant. But here they are now competing on the base, basis of speed, strength and ability. Equal sides and equal numbers to an agreed set of rules designed to ensure a fair contest and may the best team win. Here was the level playing, the level playing field denied to Eurasian women in other aspects of their lives as women, as Eurasians, as Eurasian women. Here is a photograph of um, some of the spectators at the game, men and women sitting together, mixing between the sexes as there's a mixing of the races. Is that a European woman on the left? Is the woman in the center? She looks pretty Eurasian, but she could be a light skinned Indian or a dark European. She's wearing the fashionable hat, dress and shoes that signify an era rather than an ethnicity. As if there's the promise of a shared community identified by its modernity rather than restricted on racial lines and dress. Look at the men. True, the glasses, hat and cigarette are very Western, but their ethnicity is undefined and cannot be determined on looks alone. Again, their clothes mark them out, not so much as Eurasian or European, but part of a wider cosmopolitan world populated by modern women and men and sports girls and boys. And here is the team for the girls sports club for the match. I'm not going to go through the whole team, but we'll point out standing at the far right is Zena Clark, daughter of Conrad Hercules Clark who was a leading light of the club from the very beginning, serving as secretary and president for many years. And sitting at the extreme left is Mrs. Alice Pennyfather, who was the multiple champion for Singapore and British Malaya in tennis and badminton and a local sporting legend in her own right. Now, these Eurasian women did not see themselves as radicals. And if you remember the previous picture of some of the people who watched the match, they don't either seem to be behaving as people witnessing tumultuous events. Also, and I believe this is significant, the match was in aid of the Poppy Fund, a noble cause and one which we can still donate to today by buying a plastic lapel poppy in the UK, but also a cause associated with support for the status quo and for, and for traditional values. In many ways, an ideal cause for those who wish to show their loyalty to the king and the imperial cause. However, in spite of all this, the girls sports club were trailblazers in colonial Singapore anticipating, embodying the move towards female emancipation and a growing sense of empowerment. This photograph is of the match itself. The girls sports club team had only been playing hockey for a few months and so were at a huge disadvantage to their vastly more experienced opponents. But what they lacked in terms of skill they more than made up with enthusiasm and held Miss Griffith Jones's team to a credible one all draw. I suppose reinforcing this notion of the girls as quiet, conventional revolutionaries is the location of the hockey match itself, the Padang, the ceremonial heart of colonial Singapore. In the 1930s, the Padang, which means field in Malay, was also called Raffles Plain, after the man who secured Singapore for the British, which really places it at the centre of the imperial venture. In my earlier talk, we looked at how the Padang was used to celebrate notable events for colonial Singapore, such as the King's Jubilee, and as the location where the prestigious whites-only Singapore Cricket Club 
based the Eurasian Singapore Recreation Club, illustrating the centrality of both sport and the racial divide to the British Empire and Imperial Singapore. This was where the men, usually white men, paraded and played, where Europeans versus the rest cricket matches took place, and now where some female interlopers of mixed race could show their peers, their elders and betters, what they could achieve. The match was reported in the local press, and here we have the two teams and the result in the local sporting magazine for Singapore, The Sportsman. Now, The Sportsman is interesting for a number of reasons. It was set up by three ex-pupils of Raffles Institution, two Chinese and one Malay, which is testament to the multiracial aspect of local English speaking schools. And also it is evidence of sport as a universal principle in an increasingly modern and cosmopolitan Singapore. It was also the first foray into commercial journalism by the man who would become the first president of the Republic of Singapore, Yusuf Ishak. The Sportsman was published throughout the 1930s and catered for local non-white English speaking sports fans. It would report mainly on events in Singapore and mainland Malaya, boxing, cricket, football, hockey, tennis, and what it called physical culture, which was an artistic cross between weightlifting and bodybuilding. Although its main target audience were the Paranakan Chinese, the local born Chinese community, it included Indian, Malay, European and Eurasian sportsmen and sporting events as well. The leagues and the tournaments were of a mixed nature with mixed participants. Chinese played against whites, Indians played against Eurasians, and the annual contests in cricket and hockey of the Europeans versus the rest were eagerly reported. Behind many of these competitions was Conrad Hercules Clark donating cups and shields, regardless of race, encouraging the various populations to produce serious athletes for the rest in their clashes against the Europeans. The sportsmen would increasingly report on women's sports as well and support the new female with one typical article bearing the headline, hats off to the sports girl. This is another photo from the same edition of the Sportsman reporting on a match between the girls sports club and one of those that sprung up in their wake, the McNair girls. McNair girls were, I believe, named after the place in Singapore they lived, McNair Road. And if you can read the names of the people, Lee Fong Lim, Alvis, De Silva, Cordero, Dingyo, we can see or we can, we can hear that these girls were not exclusively Eurasian. The team for the girls sports club, which won this contest by four girls to nil, is seen at the bottom half of the page and is broadly the same team as the one which played on the Padang. This is a better copy of the previous photo of the McNair girls. And, and this is from one of Conrad Clark's scrapbooks. And hopefully you can see better here and identify the racial mix of the McNair team. And what you find here are a group of Singaporean women of different ethnicities united in a shared love of sport and a shared locality, which must necessarily have been a mixed community, comfortable in their modernity, short haircuts and dressed in such a style to enable freedom of movement, of autonomy, seemingly in charge of their own destinies. Here are some more pictures from Conrad Clark's scrapbooks. We're not entirely sure why Conrad kept them, these scrapbooks, they're a kaleidoscope of sporting life in Singapore and Malaya between the wars. 
and they also include non-sporting photos of family and friends, weddings and parties, and then the occasional seemingly random press cutting from the UK. Don Bradman, the cricketer, the Surrey cricket team and the MCC. And these press cuttings are, aren't from the Sportsman magazine, but are from one of the local, the local English language newspapers of Singapore, such as the Malaya Tribune or the Straits Times, which is still in print today. Now, the year here is 1936, six years on from the first meeting between the Girls Sports Club and the team of Miss Griffith Jones. Some of the team members are different now, and the Eurasian girls are now playing what is called a European Women's Eleven. What is notable also is the difference in score six years on. The girls thrash the European women by eight goals, eight goals to nil. And this wasn't a fluke or a one-off. As we can see from another extract from Conrad Clark's scrapbooks, the girls sports club had been unbeaten in hockey and netball throughout the previous year, 1935. And by this time, a female hockey association and league were in place in Singapore, where the girls' sports club had led, had led others followed. And there was now no lack of opposing teams for the girls to play against. 20 years earlier, Racism had prevented a Chinese male team playing in the Singapore Football League. But by the 1930s, the city had mixed leagues where all the races could compete. 20 years before, Eurasian girls lucky enough to go to school received a most rudimentary education, learning to sew, playing hopscotch and catch. The Eurasian woman's place in a social and personal life was still constrained in many ways in a male dominated world, in ways we still recognize today. But somehow in the arena of sport, they created a place, a controlled space where equality, fairness and togetherness could triumph. Hopefully by now you may be familiar with some of the faces which we see here, five years older than when we first encountered them, but with the same assured pose and direct gaze, if anything, more relaxed and comfortable in their own skin than previously. And here's a picture of the Singapore badminton team the same year. And you see it's a mixed team, male and female, not solely Chinese or Indian or Malay or Eurasian. And I hope you recognise sitting at centre right, quite possibly as team captain, is Alice Pennyfather. Doyen of the Girls Sports Club. So Singapore has a multiracial team representing themselves as Eurasians, as Chinese, as Indian, as Malay, representing Singapore as they compete against multi-ethnic teams from Malay states like Selangor, Malacca and Perak, and living, if only briefly, less than an hour if you're playing badminton, in that special sporting place. Now, travel can broaden the mind, and as the sporting scene blossomed, teams and players travelled across the Singapore Causeway to mainland British Malaya to find more new sports girls waiting for them across the net. This is the hockey team for the Kuala Lumpur Girls Sports Club, modelled on and inspired by Singapore's own. And I hope you see what I can see in the same calm and self-assured look straight down the eye of the lens that we've seen in earlier shots of the girls. That same directness, unapologetic in the sense that they already know who they are and that they are worthy of respect. And here's another of the girls' opponents. In this case, it's the Malacca Girls Sports Club. Eurasian is such a fluid term and more than just a broad word used to describe an almost infinite variety of human mixedness um, containing all of the countries and ethnicities of Asia and Europe. And when talking of Singapore and Malaysia, 
The term can mean a particular community of people from a specific time and place. Now, what we mean when we say the word Eurasian is a subject for another talk. But in this photograph, I think we can see the Eurasian face in some of its great variety. The attitude and the modernity I've already spoken about. But there's also so many physical characteristics coming from the length of the Eurasian landmass in the shape of the face, the skin tones, the cheekbones, the eyes. Here is China and India. There is Portugal and Siam, Burma and the British Isles, Ceylon and Brunei. Back in colonial Singapore, and this is from the March, and this is of, sorry, the March 1932 grand opening of the grounds for the girls sports club. Until then, they'd been reliant on schools, other clubs and individuals for places to play. But two years of fundraising, dances and lotteries, the girls were not independently wealthy, meant the girls sports club had facilities to call their own. The netball, hockey, badminton and athletics. This was an important event in Eurasian social life. The ribbon we can see being tied to the club gates would be cut by the Eurasian member of the Straight Settlements Legislative Council, the most senior political position available to a Eurasian in colonial Singapore. Something to wear your Sunday best for. And yet, this picture could have been staged in almost any region of the British Empire at that time. In the Dominions, Australia, South Africa and Canada, in Scotland or, Squa or Swaziland, look now, Lusaka and Londonderry. So nothing essentially Eurasian about it, unless being Eurasian means knowing what one means when one says Sunday best which every Eurasian surely did. Markers like these, sport as well as many others, puts Eurasians firmly within a shared culture of the 1930s, now available to women as well as men, and one which can, at least under certain conditions, be colourblind. And here, enjoying the world he helped bring into being is the instigator, Conrad Clark. Clark's contribution to sport in the region was acknowledged on the front page of the Sportsman, which began to list the various trophies he had sponsored in order to promote sport amongst all of the people. The Cricket Challenge Cup, the Europeans versus the rest, the Girls Netball Shield, the Chinese Swimming Club Shield. The list goes on and on. Clark encouraged sport in his family. In the Eurasian community, the Chinese community, the Indian and Malay communities, children and adults, men and women. And here he is in 1935, watching a netball match at Raffles Girls School. Possibly a contest for the shield we can see on the left, probably donated by Conrad himself. Again, the scene reflects a multicultural Singapore of the 1930s. It's a modern scene. The races mixed comfortably in shared company, relaxed, confident, seemingly content. I do want to emphasise that this picture is a marker of modernity. Everyone in the photograph is behaving as an active participant in their own lives. I should also point out that the dress being worn on the girl by the girl on Conrad's left, a Chong Sam, was the height of fashion for Asian women in the interwar period. So a further marker of modernity and not of conformity. It originated in 1920 Shanghai, another Asian centre where the future was made. Now, this sporting nirvana ushered in by sporting girls across the world had to contend with larger realities like the ongoing collapse of the international situation, the worldwide economic depression and the Catholic Church. Progress doesn't happen at the same time 
and in the same way for everyone. Ideas about beauty and the female form can both be ahead of the times or, might, or more likely can be found to be behind the times. Not everybody found the sports girl's confidence and outgoing demeanour the, the tonic the editors of The Sportsman did. Alongside The Sports Girl, The Sportsman magazine also featured women in a more artistic, idea, idealised form similar to the artistic poses favoured in risque fin de siècle music halls and middle-class sitting rooms. A more traditional and submissive ideal of femininity than a somewhat sweaty competitor flushed with sporting success. These clever acrobatic babies, as a sportsman calls them, all have good Eurasian surnames, D'Souza, Paglar, Clooney's Ross, and are performing for the public of Singapore, mostly male, I suppose, but with a purpose more serious and elevated, perhaps, than we see with the benefit of hindsight. The display of health, healthy bodies for reasons other than titillation may have formed a part of a young lady's upbringing, and the sportsman would not have published such photos of girls who were anything less than respectable. The sportsman increasingly gave space to the sports girl. It introduced a regular section, Girls Corner, and discussed the merits of the active life for women. The sports girl was a better companion, a better wife, sister, daughter. She was happy to beat her brother at chess. She was articulate and of the coming age, unlike her grandmothers, confined to lives of seclusion, trapped indoors, far from the fresh air. There were regular reports on matches in the various women's league. An English schoolmistress teaching in Singapore wrote an article for the sportsman on the importance of sports for girls' schools and making connections between the physical education of girls across the British Empire, linking London to Singapore. Articles like these in their frequency and content speak of a female readership alongside a male one for the sportsman and reinforce the positive impact of the girl sports club and their avatar, the sports girl. This page from a March 1933 edition of The Sportsman illustrates the way the magazine reported on women's sport and the girls sports club in particular. The way it talks about the team's form, their results, the statistics, the team photographs are typical of the way the sportsman would, would regularly report any club, male or female. Also on this page is a photograph of a young swimmer of Chinese rather than Eurasian ethnicity standing in a costume in much the same pose and clothing as one used by the male bodybuilders. The sportsmen called them physical culturalists pictures of whom always filled many pages of the magazine. This page from The Sportsman has a piece telling girls how to protect their hair and skin against the sun and wind when playing sports outdoors. But what I would like to focus on here is the visual content. There is the picture of the volleyball team made up of Chinese girls, and then the advertisement, which is a drawing of a girl running a race, dressed in short sleeves and shorts and looking like a member of the volleyball team. I cannot recall seeing one of the girl sports club members wearing shorts in any of the photographs I've seen of the period. The women depicted here are first and foremost athletes. The, the evangelical mission of the sports club is therefore complete. Other teams, other girls have picked up the baton, if you, can, if you can forgive me that. And the onward march of the sports girl would continue until falling off a cliff, along with the entire imperial edifice and hundreds of thousands of innocent people when the Second World War overwhelmed colonial Singapore. But that's another story and um, one which I touch upon in my History Indoors video 
the fall of Singapore as a world historical event, which you can still catch on the History Indoors YouTube channel, should you so desire. But returning to this story, I'd, I'd like to finish with a couple more pictures of the members of the Girls Sports Club in action, as recorded in The Sportsman. And I'd like to sum up by going back to the idea of empire, of Welsh, Scots, Irish and English men and women bringing these British sports with Victorian rules with them as they moved around the world. And sport was part of that imperial baggage of plunder and the cross, of opium and the Industrial Revolution, which reinforced British values and British prestige. Sport was seen as the perfect vehicle for demonstrating the innate superiority of the English gentleman, both on physical and moral terms. The non-white population of Singapore bought into this vision to the extent that its men, excluded by race from the clubs run by the white elites, promptly set up exclusive ethnic sporting enclaves of their own. However, when you have such an entity as sport, where concepts such as fair play and a fair chance can be enforced and can be seen to be enforced, where anyone can be a, a winner with the requisite skills, then sport becomes a possible place, not owned by and for the British, but a possible place available to all, a level playing field. And this was the space the girls sports club as girls, as Eurasians, claimed as their own and opened up to all. To finish then, I hope I've been able to demonstrate that while sport was brought to the colonies like Singapore as a way for the British to promote their values and to control and to mould the imperial system to their desire, the universalist principles of sport also serve to work against the unfairness inherent in such a society. The joy attained through the effort of sporting accomplishment, through teamwork, um, blood, sweat and teams, was like temporary glimpses of a better, fairer world. Sport for all could be a transcendent demand something which could be delivered in the modern multi-ethnic space which the pioneering members of the Girls Sports Club had made possible. And, um, and, and we've come to the end of my talk. I, I hope you enjoyed it. Many thanks to Michael and everyone at History Indoors. Thanks again to Louise Clark for permission to use the magnificent pictures. Thank you to you, to everybody for watching and listening. Um, any questions or comments, please share them. My email address at Essex University is, is, is showing here. Should anyone wish to um, contact me about tonight's presentation and um, or anything else. And um, I'll, I'll pass you on now to Michael for any questions and answers. Um, feel free to comment. Um, thank you. I thank you so much, um, Josh. I think if you're all in the room, I think we would definitely give you a rousing round of applause. Um, but as we as we can't, uh, I'll, I'll just give that uh, applause here. But thank you so much for that because that was it's incredible, isn't it, to think about you know the power of sport and and what we can see through sport. You know, I think I think I think it's just such, such an incredible thing. Um, now, if anyone does have a question. Do put in the in the in the comment box, in the chat box, and we can go from there. We can ask your question. Please don't feel shy about asking anything. We are more than happy to to to, to answer any questions. Or if you said you've got any comments, please also do put them in the, in the comment box. Um, uh, you know, and and we're more. I said me, me and Josh would be more happy to 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 listen to what you have to say and uh, answer the question, of course. Um, I, I'm, I'm I'm really struck just you know while while we're um, waiting for someone to put a question in, Josh. I was really just struck by the kind of the, uh, I guess the, you know what we're talking about you know, that, that great the great case study you showed about the, the the women's hockey teams, and how you know they you got you know women's women's hockey teams 
you got a European versus a Eurasian hockey team, basically, and 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 uh, they're playing together. I mean, do you know anything about the the reaction of the time? You know, were, were people uh, obviously we've seen the sportsmen, as you said, reported on it, but do you know anything about like other popular press about it? You know, how 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 big was it as an event? Was there a lot of spectators there? Was there a lot of people watching it, or was it something that was kind of in the background? I think is a question I want to ask. Um. <sighs> It was well reported. It yeah. was it, it it was it was it was well reported both in the local press and and in magazines like like the Sportsman and and as you can see, the Sportsman dev um, devoted a number of pages to women's sport, and for this match in particular, it devoted. A whole page and um with pictures of the team each member of the team is named there was also a written match report and and so yes it was it was widely reported and um consequently i would expect it to have been widely discussed in um in local society uh in terms of a reaction to that event and to, if you like, the fact of women playing sport and also the fact that you had women of different races playing sport, um, this whole essence and idea of 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 the sports girl um was was also a controversial one because there was um an implicit criticism perhaps of um their elders and the way their elders lived and um the way that women were treated in society and the fact that um, the sportsman felt it necessary to publish articles praising the sports girl um, was proof that there was there was there was there was a certain amount of of pushback, and um, this was a still a very despite I'm I'm emphasising modernity and this particular little space of freedom but as a as a more general rule you know this is a this is an imperial society this is a colonial society it's conservative with a a, a small c in its reactionary in many of the relationships between races and between men and women so this was an event, yeah, um, undoubtedly. We, we've got some questions coming in, so um, we can we can go to those questions and see. I think actually one carries on to what you said actually in some ways, um, which is saying that thanks for the fun, fun, fascinating insights. Curious to know time money women's suffrage in Singapore and whether the school, sports girl movement helped its cause. I think Carl kind of leads nicely on from what you were saying a minute ago, really. Um, uh, uh, about the reaction and, and the like. So, would you do? You, would you feel, care, care to answer answer that question? Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose what what I would say is that um, women's suffrage came to the UK in in the nineteen twenties. Mm. Um, Singapore was a colony, and um, at that time, um, it wasn't close in terms of democracy. Um, in terms of its political um, <clears throat> institutions. And it would take the um, end of empire, really, um, for um, female suffrage to be assured in, mm. um, in, in, in Singapore. And um, it's only in the post-war period that places like the Singapore Cricket Club 
and the Singapore Recreation Club opened its doors to other races and to women. There were votes um, on that basis in the Eurasians only Singapore Recreation Club in the 1930s and the whites only Singapore Cricket Club um, to open up to female members, to open up to other races. And these were um, the members voted these down. Um, so, wow. but, but, it's, it's, you know, they, yeah. they, they're, they're trail setters, they're outliers, um, but colonial society in Singapore was particular to, um, I suppose it was like colon colonial societies were not like the Western democracies and mm. were never like the Western democracies in terms of people's freedom to say what they like, to do what they like, to vote what, or if to have the opportunity to vote what they like. It, it is fascinating as well, isn't it, as well? Because they the fact that they actually had a vote in the first place, which I think is interesting in the 30s, you said they had a vote uh, to allow... No, this story, this was a vote within the clubs. Yeah, but it's just, it's just interesting, yeah. isn't it? I, I, I wonder who instigated that. I wonder if there was anyone who, who instigated those those things. I'd be, be interested to know who that was because that would be an interesting story as well, wouldn't it, really, to think, think about that. But... By and by, yeah, got I mean, more in, in some cases, in some cases, it was it was the club's leadership um, okay. themselves that were um, trying to promote change and were being voted down by their own members, um, mm. which is not dissimilar to the way that some still some of the um, London gentlemen's clubs um, still bar their. Um, doors to um the female of the species interesting we've got we've got some more comments uh just so we're moving on um and that just says interesting very good presentation i was surprised at how early in that period women were able to participate um she enjoyed it and she looks forward to more so certainly surprised by the fact that in the 30s especially we see you know women participating in these sports mm -hmm. um but another question for you. Do you think that because Singapore was smaller, a tighter community, that it was easier for them to set up sports clubs for girls than it was in other countries or locations in the colonies? Um, that's a that's a really that's a really good question. I'm not sure. I, I couldn't really say tell you um about when in other parts of the British Empire, women were necessarily um, setting up sports clubs for themselves. Um, I think what Singapore had that maybe other parts of the empire didn't have is this is a modern cosmopolitan port city. Goods, people in constant transit and with goods and people come ideas come in comes information comes the latest modes of fashion the latest ways of thinking and so one would expect somewhere like singapore a nodal point in the international economy um would be slightly ahead of maybe more parochial upcountry um locations yeah and just jumping in just very briefly for me i know ryan would be someone to good to good to ask this as well because um i know he's he also interested in this kind of things as well but as as an idea of of space i think i think it's certainly I think certainly there's something in there as well. Having a smaller space, um, probably, and a more tighter community in that regard probably has an impact. But again, as we, as as Josh said, we, you know, we can't really measure that uh, without properly analysing other other places properly, can we? And, that, and that's the thing is that you know we need a more in depth study on, on other places to kind of get an idea of of that. But thanks for that question, Julia. Fantastic question, actually, and something to think about actually about space and place 
uh, that I'm interested in. So I, I, I'm after to look into that myself, actually. Mm. Um, also, Julia says as well, just very briefly, a great images and thank to the, you, to the, thanks, thanks to the Clark family for allowing them to be shared with us. Um, is there anything you want to, you, you, you want, you want to add to that, uh, Josh? About the Clark well, family? I, I mean, what I would say is, is that this is just a selection of of mm. of of photographs and um they're, they're they're fantastic um they give such i think a, a an insight and to to the times to the people um being able to see and um try and read the expressions on on people's faces um enables us to get some sort of idea of what they're feeling what what they what mm. what people are thinking and and so a, a collection like the clark's um like louise's clark's collection is priceless um for somebody like myself that's trying to recreate and understand the history of of this small um, community uh, in a particular place and at a particular time. Hundred percent, hundred percent. I think it's a fantastic little sense of um, uh, things that you that you that you discovered there as well. And mm. just some more comments about a great presentation, Josh. Bringing he's bringing history alive, and I, I love that that comment there. Um, mm. I, th I think Thank you. certainly you've done a great job in presenting that uh, uh, to us, Josh. I mean, I've learned so much. Um, Conrad, just a, my, own, my my own last kind of question, I guess, because we are coming to time. Mm. Um, Conrad himself, I mean, how big an influence did he have in the 30s and, and sport, do you think? I mean, he seems like quite an influential figure. He was sponsoring a lot of different clubs and different trophies. You know? Yeah, I, th I, think, I think it was, I mean... I know the Clark family are trying to count the number of trophies and competitions he 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 sponsored in in this period. Um, sadly, he died during the war, and so it, it didn't continue into the post-war period. Mm -hmm. But the number of cups, shields, trophies—I mean, they're going into uh, the thirties and numbers wise into into probably around 50 different competitions that he sponsored and it was i think the way that he did that without regard for um any particular community mm. um was 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 remarkable for for the time and um it, it displays a, a degree of color blindness that um was sadly absent from many aspects of of life in in colonial singapore and so although he was a prime mover within the eurasian community his influence spread outside just the Eurasian community and sport in Singapore in general um, has a great debt to him. Because, because yeah, sorry. Yes, no, sorry. Because because he introduced, encouraged participation, competition, and and was a believer in this positive um, idea of of sport i said he sounds like an absolutely fast fascinating fascinating mm. character and um you know certainly uh seems to have a massive impact so thank you for mm. answering that question because he did he does seem very fascinating mm. kind of guy um well thank you josh we, we, we've come to our time now and the uh, questions have dried up so thank you so much josh for that, that fantastic talk uh we have learned so much and the impact of sport as well just to think how, how what sport can do i think is a wonderful kind of um 
uh, a thing to think about as well. Um, you know, it's not, not just it's not just entertainment; it, it brings people together. I think that's a wonderful thing to take away as well from from today's talk. But and the impact it had in Singapore. So thank you, Josh, for that. I I, I think and thank you for presenting it so well. Um, thank you, everyone, for turning up and, and asking your questions and being involved yes, as well. Yes, thank you, everybody. Yes, we thank you so much mm-hmm. for being here. Um, we, ho- we hope uh, you subscribe to the channel that you that you like 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 the like like the video as well, so we can share share it with, this, with your friends and family as well, so they can learn more about this topic as well. Um, and do go back and watch Josh's other talks because they're fantastic. He's done he's done so many on on Singapore. Um, they're worth a watch if you want to if you want to know more about his period. So please do do that. Go back and watch his videos and uh, leave a like and, and comment that that you come from this video as well, maybe. But we'll say bye for now. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here, and we hope you have a f- fantastic evening or rest of the day wherever you're from in, in in the world. And hopefully, we'll see you in a month's time for our next history and doors talk. Um, and we've got a lot lined up, so keep your eyes out for what's coming up next. But until then, thank you so much to Josh. Thank you to yourself, and we will see you very very soon. So that's bye from me and. Bye from Josh.